and a very warm and cordial welcome, my dear brother and sister and friend in the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Hope for the Time of the End. Yours truly, Harold Zapata with Advent on Ministries in cooperation with Loma Linda Broadcasting Network here in their beautiful studios as we're presenting these uh, series of messages of a prophetic timeline, prophetic tangent, Hope for the Time of the End. And today we'll be talking about on the eve of Armageddon. This uh, is a very special message and we need to have the Holy Spirit accompanying us and, and breathing through His Word today. So help me just to, to pray right now a quick prayer to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray you send us your Holy Spirit as together we enter into the realm of the prophetic and give us the eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit speaks to our heart, the Lord Jesus to our minds, what you desire to bring us to this closer walk with your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. Lead us as we talk about this very important message in Jesus' name, amen. The days in which we're living in are dangerous days. Jesus likened his days as when the days of Lot or the days of Noah took place. There was a lot of violence in the land. People would steal and kill for literally any reason. There were many wars and rumors as war, of wars today, and then as we have them today. The Bible tells us that many of the signs of the times have to do with wars and kingdoms rising against kingdoms and nations rising up against nations. We see this today with what's happening out there in Europe with the Russia and Ukraine that could spill out into an all-out World War III. We hear the, the drumbeats of war taking place right now out there in China, between China and Taiwan, and what will the U.S. and Australia and, and Great Britain and Europe do about that? We're seeing China now being able to uh, cover several countries with, with packs and accords, even bringing together Iraq and Iran together with the Saudis. Uh, we see the great conflagration taking place right now with North Korea and the many missiles and now interballistic missiles that are being uh, shot over uh, their eastern um, uh, fr frontiers into the, into the ocean. Uh, these are days in which pretty much in every continent around the world there are wars taking place. And not just with wars, but also with the love of many waxing cold and people just killing for no reason whatsoever. Almost every day in the U.S., a new mass shooting. Around the world, the same thing. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, our friends in Jesus, as we learn the prophecies, the thought of having a certain God in uncertain times, the thought of being able to look toward the future and recognize that we are on the eve of great events, that the, that the winds of prophecy are pushing us forward to this divine event that looks like all situations are pushing all of us into. We are not left without a rudder. We are not left without a captain. We are not left without a friend. Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. But yes, you shall hear of wars. You shall hear of rumors of wars. And there may be some very scary things in the very near future. Things that will make 9-11 pale. Brothers and sisters, let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in the Lord who said, Jesus Christ, I am with you always. Even if a big bomb goes off, I am with you always. Even if there's a terrible shooting in a mall or a school or a church, I am with you always. Even into the end of the world. And we are being ushered into the end of the world. Ushered, ushered by winds of strife. 
Angels are holding back winds of strife so that people like you and me could learn the truth and sell it not. That we can know the truth and love the truth. That the truth can have us. While this is taking place, we are being sealed in our foreheads and angels are holding back those winds of strife. To this end, we talk about the eve of Armageddon. We are living in dangerous times, but be of good cheer. God has seen it all. God, after all, is the author of time. Your Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 40 how God made time. It is God that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are, are as grasshoppers. It is God that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So think about this. When we read in the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth or uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He made all things. He made space. And how He did that, it's incredible. Imagine hands out of nowhere, and He now out of nothing stretches forth and calls the space. And as He's stretching this space, He then hangs spheres. And these spheres are still, it's, Darkness covers all of the universe. There is no light. Many of these spheres are just balls of water. And you can just imagine chaos, complexity. You have darkness and God knows what's in the dark. Never be afraid of what's in the dark. God knows what's there. And God, he said, let there be light. When he stated, let there be light, now the little spheres start moving. And with the movement of the celestial bodies, now we have time. In the beginning, there is no beginning if it doesn't move. But now that everything starts moving, now we mark time. In the beginning. So God creates the beginning by stretching out space, putting matter, and making it move. Therefore, God is the author of time. He is the great uh, keeper of the timepiece. God knows all things that happen in chronological form in the past, in the present, and in the future. The Bible tells us in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day of 24 hours is with the Lord as if it were a thousand years, and a thousand years is as if it were only one day. So think about this for a moment. When the Lord Jesus Christ finished creating the heavens and the earth, He stretched everything out, He puts it in there. The Creator does not live confined in time. The Creator is from everlasting to everlasting. The Creator has no beginning, and He has no end. The great creator intersected our time and came into our world for 33 and a half years. That's the story that we all know about when God became flesh. But this great creator then came back and was taken up from among us. And today he stands before God the Father making intercession for us. But he's coming back again. Jesus is alive. And he is coming back again to this world in which he lived for 33 and a half years. Now, he has the right to tell us about Bible prophecy, that is the future, because Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10 tells us, God declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Think about this. God is a great king and his great uh, words go out and his words don't come back to him void. God is a great prophet. He can see all things. All time and eternity is in the palm of his hands. 
for him one day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is one day, because he dwells outside the tent. He does not live in the tent. That's where we live and we age, but he is eternal. He lives outside of the time-space continuum. He created it. And he stated that this is not an absentee landlord. He is very much involved in every single dancing molecule that you see on Sunday morning when the suns of the, uh, the rays of the sun come in your room and you see all that little dust. Each and every dancing molecule is <laughs> guided under his supreme and sovereign will and authority. His counsel will stand and he will do all things for God is a sovereign God. That's why we can state with all assurance as 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 says, we also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well to take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, unto the day dawneth and the day star arise in your hearts. My friend, we have a sure word. And it's not just a sure word, it's a more sure word of prophecy. Prophecy is to be able to declare something that is going to happen, and it happens. And we read, God says, I declare the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end, upside down, inside out. Now, the basis for all Bible prophecy is found in the book of Daniel, and here chapter 2. And in Daniel chapter 2, we have a young monarch, his dad just died, Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonian Empire. He just came back from bringing the smartest young people from Jerusalem. And he brings them and he's going to give them of his food and uh, of his education. And uh, four young Hebrew worthies said, look, we're just not going to eat that. Give us a test of a couple of days, 10 days. Let's just give us some legumes, uh, water, just simple meals. Um, we're not going to eat brain, uh, monkey brains, <laughs> whatever they had back then. Um, and they were found favorable. And they were made wiser than almost any wise man there. But then the king had a dream. And the dream that he dreamt, well, when he woke up, he forgot it. God gave it to him. God took it away. And he brought all his soothsayers and magicians and wise men. And no one can tell him the dream or its significance. And he said, well, I'm going to kill you all. And here comes a soldier. He's going to kill Daniel and his three uh, Hebrew friends. And he says, why, why this such hasty, harsh decree? Well, because he's found that all you guys are just charlatans and you're all done. He says, well, have him give me one night. Let me talk to God. And God gave Daniel the dream that he gave Nebuchadnezzar. He comes up the next day and he presents himself to Nebuchadnezzar. And he says the following in Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. As he stands behind him, he says, But there is a God in heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the last days, in the latter days, in our day. And thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Thou, O King, sawest. Behold, the great image, this great image was, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet and part of iron, part of clay. And thou sawest until a stone, a rock, was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them and the stone that smote the image became a large mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream and we will now tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, hath he given them into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. 
And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. And another third kingdom of brass shall be rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas that thou sawest the feet and toes, potter, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but shall there be left in it some strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, sh they shall mingle themselves with the seed of man, but they shall not cleave one to the other, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of those toes of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut off from the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God of heaven hath made known to the king what shall come to pass in the last days. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. Can I hear an amen and praise the Lord and hallelujah among the people of God? You can take this to the bank. God is coming back again and his kingdom shall last forever. Jesus Christ will be seen by all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. The tribes of the earth shall wail and mourn. And there will be a people saying, however, this is our God. We have waited for him. We shall be rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The dream is certain. What dream? The dream that stated, you are the head of gold. The dream that says, this is our day in the light of Bible prophecy. You are the head of gold because God gave you a kingdom. Babylon was the richest of all the empires. Babylon had a beautiful city, hanging gardens, one of the great wonders of the world. Walls 54 feet, uh, miles in circumference with the 12 um, we call these 12 chariot um, lanes wide. People would live inside the walls. It had a huge river called the Euphrates River going smack dab down the middle, hanging gardens, beautiful uh, gold and lions and winged lions. You are the head of gold. Just like when someone wins a marathon or some sort of Olympics, they get the golden medal. And then comes after you the, the chests and arms of silver, after you, another kingdom shall, shall come after you. We read that actually in Daniel 5. How a, a great man by the name of Cyrus, that God had prophesied 120 years before he was born in the book of Isaiah, Cyrus came and made the first man-made lake, diverted the waters of the Euphrates. Uh, the people inside of Babylon, they knew that they were surrounded by the Medo-Persians, but they were throwing bread and water outside. They had enough provisions to last them for over 20 years inside. But... The waters went down. A couple of soldiers came under the, 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 the gates, the iron gates, the bronze gates. They killed some soldiers from the inside and they opened the two leave gates and in comes that evening Cyrus and his uncle Darius and they come in and they put an end to the last king of Babylon. But then after the gold, then comes silver, first place, second place. So you see the metals diminish in value but they get stronger in strength because now we got silver is stronger than gold, but it's of less value. But then after silver comes bronze. And then after, of course, the Medo-Persian Empire, look it up, is Greece, Alexander the Great, uh, the son of uh, Philip of Macedon. And at the age of 18, he says, I'm 21, I'm taking off after my own empire. And that's exactly what he did. And just in less than 33 and a half years that he lived on this earth, conquered all the known world there, the southern part of Europe, all the way to knocking on the door of Nepal and India and China. This is a great conqueror, this Alexander the Great. And God knew it, and he's covered by this belly and thighs of brass. And then afterwards would come another kingdom, 
those of two legs, Eastern Rome and Western Rome, the Roman Empire of iron, the strongest of all. And this great empire, we, we know it as the empire where, when Christ came upon this world. And, and it was a great a empire of great persecution. And it did a lot of harm to other nations. But it was stronger than any other. But then we come the Mongolians, the Vikings, and the other Germanic tribes. And they came and settled in that western part of Europe that today we call uh, Europe that western part of Rome, uh, the Anglo-Saxons became, of course, the UK, and the, the Franks became the French, the Alamanni became the Germans, and so forth and so on. And now we have this Roman Empire divided. Now we got the ten toes, part of iron, part of clay. The days in which we are living in, in fact, when we take a look at the toes and the days that we are living in, we are living in the very, very last days when these toes are showing us Jesus is coming again. It is in the days of these kings, of those last kings, that God himself is going to set up a kingdom. And it's not going to hit it in the days of Babylon or Medo-Persia or Greece or Rome. God is giving us that understanding for us to know if Babylon happened and then Medo-Persia two arms, and then Greece, and then two legs, Eastern Roman, Western Roman Empire. And we trace these, all these wars to make all this happen and the division of the European nations and how they try to mingle with their own seed, which caused first, uh, the First World War, as we all know. And, and now even today, Europe has some of strength, like Germany, and we can't say the UK because of Brexit, but you never know. And then you have a lot of weakness going on, like Greece and Portugal. My point is, some of it is strong, some of it is weak. And God saw that. And God put this as the foundation upon which we're going to learn Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 9. We put all these visions on top of this one like a good medical encyclopedia. The very first page you're going to see there is, for example, the skeletal system. And after the skeletal system, you put the muscular system, and then you put the digestive system, and then you put the nervous system on top of it, and now you start getting the whole picture. This is the exact same thing that we're studying here today. As we look as we are in the eve of Armageddon, we know that the history of humanity has been the history of warfare has been the history of nations conquering nations and being able to forge new boundaries and new territories and nations defending their, their borders and their territories or not defending them and allowing them themselves to be conquered. My point is that God has seen all things. He knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. And although this is true of a metal man whose head is of gold and arms uh, and chests of silver and belly and thighs of brass and legs of iron and feet part of iron and part of clay, it's also true about you and me. God loves you and God knows you and God has a special plan for you. He has said, I know the thoughts that I have for you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a hope and to give you a future. The hope and future in this middle man is a stone, is a rock, not cut off with human hands. This world's not going to end with a big nuclear atomic a hydrogen bomb. It's not going to end this way with some big earthquake or a small molecule that's being right now cooked up in some Chinese lab that has a 50% mortality rate. COVID had a 1.5% mortality rate. They have some that are over 50%. That's not how it's going to end. Because God says so. Because His counsel shall, shall stand. Because his word that has already gone out has already declared it because he cannot lie and he has seen it because for him one day is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day and that's why God loves you and God knows you and God has a plan for you as well as for your neighborhood, our nation and the world. And you and I can be brought into the tapestry 
of this beautiful plan that God has. For there will be a people for whom this kingdom is coming for. God is jealous for you. God sings over you. God wants to rescue you with a rescue mission from the stars. Will we now receive that gift and allow it to be saved and rescued by the captain of our faith and our salvation? Will we allow him to rescue us where we're at and be able to say one day, that kingdom we're going to see. He said, every eye shall see him. Every eye and the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they, many shall say to the rocks and to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that's seated in the cloud because every eye shall see him. But there'll be other group of people and they're going to say, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him. Behold, this is our Savior. We shall rejoice and be glad in his salvation. To us, to us is Christ coming. He said, he said, I will go back to my father's house. And if I go there, I will prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back again. And I will take you so that where I am, there you may be also. Here on this earth, Jesus said in John 17, Father, I just want this one thing. My desire is that those that you've given me, that you, that you have them to come and see the glory that you gave me before the foundation of the world. Jesus is coming for you because he loves you. He's coming for us as a church, the apple of his eye. He will infill us with the Holy Ghost to be ready in the latter rain. He will grant us the power to preach the everlasting gospel, to prepare the final harvest to go home. The earth was reaped, the Bible says. The kingdom is coming. It is the kingdom of God in your day and my day. And now we can be ready for what is coming because of Jesus, his word, in his name. Amen. Thank you for watching Advent On with Harold Zapata. We pray you've been inspired to grow in your personal daily walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn how to partner with us to take the whole truth into the whole world, stop by adventon.org or send your prayers and financial support today to Advent On Ministries, P.O. Box 333, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Preparing the way restoring the truth and uplifting Jesus' life. This program was a presentation of Advent On Ministries, Loma Linda, California.